I'd now like to introduce Ricky Ansley. Please make a welcome. Thank you. All right, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Um, someone told me earlier to be careful because this font might not show up, and my answer was, that's okay, I changed the title, which I'll show on the next slide anyway. Um, but this is um, a nice example of when you submit a uh, talk proposal, and then you go and write it, and then it changes a little bit, and then you throw in a Stephen King angle and a cat to make it all come together. So my name is Ricky Inslee. I work on opensource.com, which is a, a Red Hat supported site. And I was, um, we aren't a, a Red Hat marketing site or product site, however, we're a community site. And so um, I was really careful uh, to use examples from different communities in my, um, in my slides. But then you'll see that one of the companies we bought since I made my slides, but they're, um, the examples are still relevant, so I left those in. But uh, anyway, it's an open site, a community site. A um, bunch of different kinds of articles on there, so I encourage you to check it out. And uh, some of the things I will cover in here are based on my experience on opensource.com, but then um, just my history as a tech journalist and as a writer. So before you even really think about writing, you have to define a few things. Um, you need to know what you're writing about and uh, why you're writing about it. What's the actual purpose? Um, because that's going to help you focus the article or the report. Um, or the talk, or the um, uh, update on your site. And you really have to be mindful of who the reader is. In uh, open source communities, we actually have quite a few different levels of technical expertise and roles and communities. And so who is going to be reading this piece will be really important um, when you start writing it. And um, you need to be mindful of if you'll reuse your content. Because if you're going to reuse your content and uh, write it for different audiences, you're going to wa want to write the um, hardest piece, the one that has the most information in it and the most details first, generally, so that you can go ahead and pull out those bits and make these other pieces that you'll repurpose for different audiences. And then you'll um, you know, be thinking about your research. You'll create an outline and then do the writing and then revising. So there are quite a few steps. This makes it sound like, sound like it's going to take a long time. And depending on how often you write, it might, or how experienced you are. Um, but like any muscle, the more you use uh, your writing uh, muscle, it gets a lot easier. Um, so uh, you, here, here are some examples of what you might be writing about and why you might be writing. Um, let your community know about a bug fix or a security update. Provide a project status to a manager that's going to be a different audience. Tell developers about a new process for submitting patches, for example, um, or to inform the press about um, the latest software release. And then within these communities, there are um, generally three categories of readers. You're going to have the lay reader that has no special or expert knowledge and usually no need for background or information, and they expect um, some definition and description. Now, uh, you don't have to take extensive notes, because I, I've written uh, about all of this, and um, I will give you the link again at the end um, for the Stephen King article I wrote that's on our site. And so it's going to have links to these kinds of resources in it and um, a list of resources at the end. But um, these examples, I think, nicely sum up uh, examples or uh, categories of readers. And this is from the writing department at a university. And um, they'll have more resources, too. But managerial is going to be a, a different kind of audience. And then you have your experts. And uh, they tend to be the most demanding. And that's where you're going to uh, uh, you know, want to include the most details. And make sure everything is current and up to date, too. Because uh, of course, our technology changes so fast, you'll want to have most current resources. Um, tech journalists are in a league of their own when it comes to an audience. And so if you're thinking about writing uh, about an update to your product or a new release, um, a, a startup, or uh, anything like that, often open source projects and communities don't have professional writing staff on hand uh, or on the team, you know, or uh, experienced uh, PR people, communications professionals. Um, and even if they do, often they aren't uh, really writing to tech journalists. So I encourage you to uh, read this, because this is written by a group of tech journalists who are well respected in our field. And um, I would also encourage you to send this uh, resource to colleagues who are responsible for writing any kind of press releases, because it's just um, 
really uh, thorough and detailed best practices for writing to tech journalists, what details to include, how to approach them. Um, I am in a, a mailing list with a lot of tech journalists, and I can tell you uh, approaching a tech journalist the wrong way and making it difficult for them to cover your content, uh, uh, you won't even get a door open for you, and you can e easily get blocked by them. And so I encourage you to read this wonderful resource that's free online. Um, so when we're thinking about our audience on opensource.com, uh, because we, we cover all kinds of open source communities, we cover uh, all kinds of topics. We cover uh, open source in education and healthcare, more uh, technical uh, content, open source uh, projects that are being used by sysadmins, um, open source tools for developers. And so we have to be very mindful of that when we go in, um, because we have the, the layperson, um, uh, the managers and the experts. And so we can assume some knowledge, you know, when people come to opensource.com, generally we assume that they've either come in on the landing page that we have, a resource page called what is open source, and, uh, or they already have an idea of what open source is. And so generally we, we wouldn't define open source in every uh, article, but we would want to early on um, in, you know, first paragraph ideally give somebody an idea of what they need to know before they start reading this article so we don't lose a reader from the very beginning. Um, if we have a, a reader come in and they are reading an article, a documentation article on do you need screenshots uh, for your documentation, obviously we're not going to have to go into detail about what documentation is. On that note, if you ever have to write documentation, which um, you probably do or should or will, um, Rich Bowen, one of my colleagues, uh, gives a really great talk. If you ever have the opportunity to see him, it's um, RTFM, which you probably know what that means, how to write a manual worth reading. And so when I saw him give that talk, I, I was like, you've got to get this in print. Uh, you need to document this talk. And uh, I have just a place for you. And so he wrote this really great article for us. And then I subsequently launched a, a whole series of documentation articles on their site. So um, that's a great resource if you're writing documentation. Even if uh, you've already been writing documentation, I encourage you to go read that. Um, he has great feedback for writing documentation and um, links uh, for um, you know, learning more about writing documentation or for improving your documentation. So if you think you're ready to write, uh, this is where the Stephen King advice comes in. Um, don't start writing yet. <laughs> you um, have defined your audience. Um, but there's still a few things you should do before you uh, dive in. So I've been thinking about writing fiction lately, and um, I have been working in tech for so long that I realized I hadn't been uh, reading fiction in a long time. And so to shift gears and write um, in a whole different you know, genre, I uh, started reading books on how to write in that genre. So I picked up uh, On Writing, A Memoir of the Craft by Stephen King last summer. And um, that's what helped inspire this talk, because his advice for writing fiction I thought was really good for improving your writing for technical content also. And so I will uh, use some quotes of his throughout here, but um, one thing is, you know, reading before you start writing is going to help you. Um, so he says that from the very beginning, if you want to be a writer, you must be able to do two things above all others, read a lot and write a lot. There's no way around these two things that I'm aware of, no shortcut. And um, I'm, I don't really trust people who say that uh, they never read, but they're writers anyway. Uh, generally, they aren't the best writers, so you can write without reading, but you're, you're, not, you're not doing uh, yourself any service, and you would definitely be a better writer by reading other uh, read, uh, writers. Um, if you're given a writing assignment at work, uh, from the very beginning, uh, let's say a manager asks for a report, um, you're going to want to be clear on what the expectations are for that report. And um, generally, I ask for examples, and uh, I want to see what a, you know, a previous person has submitted. Um, or I will ask for a manager, you know, give me a bulleted list of what you want included in this. Um, or I will, if I'm, uh, I've had positions before, and I'm sure many other people here have, where um, it's a position created for you or it's a new position, so you have nothing to compare it to. And of course, Google's your friend there. You're generally not writing a kind of thing that no one has ever written before. Many people here probably have to go home and give a report on what you did here, and uh, that it wasn't just all parties and dinners, and that you actually got some technical content out of the event, and it was worth it for your company to send you here. Um, Leslie Hawthorne, does anybody know Leslie Hawthorne? 
right? Everyone loves her. Um, but she did your, your groundwork for you, and she wrote this uh, great piece on how to write an excellent post-event wrap-up report. So there's, you know, go read that, write your report, and then send her a thank you note. <laughs> Um, so when I, um, I, I wrote the outline for this talk, and it's funny how things change, and then um, it became this whole Stephen King thing. Uh, and uh, so I did my, you know, my reading and writing, and I started, uh, um, you know, writing my outline and, and, and thinking about this, and um, it was funny how it gelled, and I had thought about writing my talk first, and as I started doing the research, I was thinking about, like I said, you know, who might who might this be good for? What other audiences might I want to do this for? Well, every time I've ever given a talk before, my intent has always been to go back and write an article about it. And I'm always like, this will be a great article. I'm going to go write it you know, for whatever site or whatever publication I'm on. And um, I've never done that once that I can recall. <laughs> you know, because once the talk's done, I'm like, oh, yeah, my talk's done. It was great. And so um, this time, um, as I was thinking about, you know, the lessons I was going to give others, because I'm really good about telling other people how to write or edit, and then I go, you know, read my stuff, and I'm like, whoa, someone should have told me I did this. Um, so I went ahead and I did the hardest part. I wrote the full article first, and it was by far the more, you know, detailed piece, which is great now, because you don't have to take thorough notes. I already did all this, you know, and I'm, I should have done this years ago. Um, but then I was able to just go through and pull stuff out that I'd already put in the article, you know, for my, my um, talk. So um, that's a, a really good thing to keep in mind is um, thinking about how you're going to repurpose it for your different audiences. I'm all about streamlining work, um, uh, saving time and energy wherever possible, multitasking, you know. And, uh, in fact, when I went to grad school, um, I was already working full time in journalism, you know, and I, I went to get my master's in journalism. And uh, I was working on a tech publication, and you know they're like, "What do you want to write your thesis on?" And I was like, "Well, what can I use at my job?" You know, and so I wrote, uh, you know, my my project on uh, uh, how to highlight what women were doing in, in open source communities, and uh, made a blog out of it for our website. And so I was able to create content over here, and then turn it into, you know, papers like it turned into school. Um, much more efficient use of everyone's time, and uh, you're not having to write multiple pieces, report, article, blog post for your community. Um, so anyone familiar with Ansible? They're kind of a big deal, right? <laughs> um, so Greg is the um, VP of community at Ansible. And uh, it's a popular uh, open source automation tool and um, re recently uh, acquired by Red Hat a, a few months ago. It wasn't when I put this in. I really was trying to be not Red Hat centric. but. Um, most, <laughs> and most people don't know that it has been because Ansible has such a good reputation on their own. So when I was researching, I wanted to give some real specific examples of how um, you could tell one story but tell it differently for different audiences um, and how uh, it, it, just, it uh, will make it much more readable and it helps in community building if you're um, speaking to your different audiences. I mean, it's... Uh, it, maybe you think it saves time to just write the one, you know, announcement about your update or your new release, but if you're writing it for developers and then you're writing it for end users, um, they actually see that new release very differently and they use it differently and they need different information out of it. So he um, sent a note to um, the, a developer mailing list about the, the new process and um, uh, it, what was it? it was uh, acceptance of new mod for new modules and extras. So he didn't need to define what the extras were, and he need to he didn't need to define a bunch of developer terms because he was speaking to a developer audience. And um, so often, uh, like where I am, I will write multiple reports to different audiences. In this case, there are two different people at the company who wrote about the same thing. So if you're lucky, you have two different people, but in our case, it's usually one of us having to write to multiple audiences. So his colleague Robin then wrote about the exact same news story, but for a different audience. And um, so she's writing to the general community. And she defines that at the very beginning, um, you know, if you're uh, a user of Ansible, you know, and, um, and so she defines who is this piece for. You know, he didn't have to define it. He sent his to, directly to a developer private mailing list its developers. This is for bigger community, and so, um, you know, she defines at the very beginning who the audience is, who's going to want to even read this piece. 
So um, lesson two from Stephen King, invite the reader in, and that's what Robin did. An opening line should invite the reader to begin the story. Um, it should say, listen, come in here. Um, I want, uh, you'll want to know about this. Um, at opensource.com, many of our writers are not professional writers and not experienced writers. A lot of them aren't native English speakers. Some of them are very experienced writers. Um, one thing um, many of them have in common is I won't know until paragraph five what they're talking about or who the story is for. And I'm like, oh, this is what this is about. So move that up here and now start. You know, in your first paragraph, you're going to want to say, this is what I'm talking about and this is who's going to want to read this. You can always go back and, invite, and revise your introduction later, um, but, but a strong first paragraph, just what I'm talking about and who is it for. And uh, you can change it later if, as, as you're going through, you decide, um, no, this isn't um, going to be about this, it's going to have Stephen King references in it, so now I'm going to go change that introduction. You know, but at least you have a thing to go back to. And it helps keep you on track. And then, um, Number three, he says, tell a story. When you write a story, you're telling yourself a story. And when you rewrite, your main job is taking out all the things that are not the story. Um, it's the whole rabbit hole thing. I think we're all guilty of it. You start telling the story, and then you're like, oh, and this reminds me. And then you dive into this whole new you know, section, and then you start giving a whole background on, you know, you, you started off with good intentions to talk about this uh, trick you can do in GIMP, but then you just spent five uh, paragraphs on how to install GIMP. Well, it wasn't an article about installing GIMP. It was supposed to be a release about this you know, new feature that was added in update whatever. And so that's where you want to go in and pull out those things that are not part of the story, uh, add hyperlinks or a list of references at the end. Um, and then leave out the boring parts. <laughs> and some of those are the same thing, I guess. So um, another Stephen King quote. Mostly when I think of pacing, I go back to Elmer Leonard, who explained it so perfectly by saying he left out the boring parts. This suggests cutting to, speeds of, uh, to speed the pace, and that's what most of us end up having to do. Kill your darlings, kill your darlings. Even when it breaks your egocentric little scribbler's heart, kill your darlings. Um, I hate uh, word counts, and anytime anybody asks me how long an article should be, how many words should it be, my answer is as long as you need. Um, it, it makes no sense to me to say 750 words. You know, I will randomly throw out uh, numbers because people like them, and I'll say somewhere between 500 and 1500 words. <laughs> and that doesn't really help them, but some people need to know the word count. It should be as long as it needs to be, you know? In the revision process, that's when you go in and you realize you left some stuff out, you add on. Um, unless you're getting paid by word count or you're writing for a print publication, um, which can only fit a certain number of words per print page, um, I, don't, I don't think there's a reason why you would be counting your words. Um, thank you. All right, thanks. <laughs> Um, all right, so, and anyway, if it, if it gets too long, when people, you know, write for us, my answer is, if it's too long, I'm going to break it into sections. I'll let you know, and we'll, we'll do a two-part series or three-part series. If it's too short, I'm going to let you know that you left out a bunch of stuff, and so don't worry about it. First draft, you send it in, and we'll figure out length then. Don't count your words. Um, so, back to uh, the example I was talking about with uh, Greg. Um, he left out details for the developer audience that they wouldn't need um, about developing modules. Instead, he, um, because it wasn't about developing modules, you know, uh, it was about, you know, something related to developing modules, but if people needed to know about developing modules, that's a different story. And so he just links to that, you know, uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, now, Robin's, uh, when Robin wrote to a bigger audience about the same thing, the boring parts for you know, her audience was Greg's post, basically, because he was writing to a developer audience. So he would have had the nitty gritty details of um, you know, the uh, improvements for a developer. And so when she's um, giving a bigger update for the community, then she's going to link to developer nitty gritty details you know, in Greg's post, which she does. Can you read that from there? Um, yeah, so she, she just gives a little more background on Greg, and uh, if, if you can't read it very clearly, it's not pertinent to the story, but it's in the article that um, I wrote on our site. And so she explains what the problem was, 
what the solution is in more broad and general terms since these aren't developers necessarily that she's speaking to in a community post. And um, so then after she states, you know, uh, you know, who the audience is, what the problem was, then she goes into what the solution is and dives into a little bit more details on what the solution is here um, and the general process and then hyperlink to the guidelines. So hyperlinks are your friends. We didn't have them back when I only worked in print. Um, so here's a sample outline. Um, I always write with an outline. In school, I hated it. I thought it was stupid. I thought it was a waste of time. And now, anytime I'm writing anything, I do an outline. For the purposes of um, the article I did based on this talk, um, I had already written an outline. I wrote an outline when I wrote a proposal, you know? And then um, I was able to go back through that list, and then I could tweak it a little bit, you know? Um, I was a little committed at that point because I had sent in the outline as a proposal and so I was a little committed. If it's your own personal outline, you're not so committed, you could be flexible about what you're, you're covering and you're going to include. So you're going to want the introduction, invite the reader in, provide a brief background, share the news, wh whatever it is, uh, explain the solution and then conclude. Um, important dates and action items and further details, where to find more information. Um, a sample outline for a more technical article, tutorial, or white paper, you're going to do the same thing, but you're going to have a section in there on um, uh, getting more technical, how-to steps, uh, FAQ, you know, what, uh, what problems people might encounter, you know, that um, they might not have thought of and where they can uh, get troubleshooting, perhaps. Um, any longer articles include subheads. It's a little roadmap as people are, are reading through a longer article, you know, in this section, how to, you know, how to get started, how to install, how to uh, configure, um, how to deploy, whatever. You're going to want some little, just a little roadmap throughout your article. And then again, your, your conclusion. Um, was anyone in Randy's talk earlier today? Okay, well, so I had to go update my slides after that because she had a bunch of dogs. And um, it's, it's really easy to find dog stuff everywhere in the world, but cat people um, are left out a lot, and so I threw my cat in. <laughs> and so um, uh, I, I know this is a little bit hard to read. I, I don't normally do a lot of wordy slides, but when you're talking about uh, writing, it's kind of hard to avoid it. Uh, so I'll just read real quickly what this is about. Uh, I wanted to use a real example. The real project is not called Project Buffy, but uh, somebody actually wrote in about a new project and uh, said, do you want a story on this? Well, they didn't send me much detail. They didn't send an outline. And uh, many other publications wouldn't work with you if you um, uh, didn't write a more thorough proposal. You know, it's just like if you're sending in a talk proposal, if, you don't, if you're like, I'm going to talk about Raspberry Pi. Well, that's great. Um, can you give me a little more detail what are you talking about on Raspberry Pi, right? So this, this person wrote in and said, we're going to talk about this. And I was like, that's great. Because uh, I hadn't heard of it before. I Googled, it looked like a cool project. But so I wrote back and gave them a sample outline. And so um, I'll say Project Buffy is what we'll call this. So I wrote, you know, what is Project Buffy? I don't even know what this is. You know, in the very beginning, what is it? A brief history of the project. Um, when did you open source it? Why did you open source it? Um, how is it different from the other? It's an event calendar app. And so I said, how is this different from any other? What are the different features of functionalities? Um, what should event organizers consider before using this? Because there are other apps out there, so why would any organizer want to use it? What are the gotchas? You know, what um, might they stumble uh, on you know, when they're trying to use this? Um, are there any technical details they need to be mindful of? Is this only going to work on one kind of phone and, and not any other phones? And um, um, which events are currently use it, using it? And, uh, and then I just said, you might have answered this earlier, but these are the little details. And then in conclusion, I said, where can readers learn to um, uh, find out more, read more documentation, download uh, the project, and contribute to the community? Um, so I sent that a few weeks ago, and we got the actual draft in this week. Um, I can't tell you if they did all this yet. I haven't reviewed it, but um, these were my suggestions, so we'll see. Um, the care and feeding of the press, which I referred to earlier, uh, uh, they actually are also a good just resource in general for best writing practices. And I was looking through some of the, um, the fact sheet they include, that, or they say that everybody should include a fact sheet when they submit a press release. Um, but the details they suggest including in a fact sheet are often things that you would want to include in any kind of a technical writing you're doing. 
announcing an update or um, a new project, uh, a new release. So um, I, I just thought that was kind of handy. The uh, URLs for additional contact information and that sort of thing. Um, cost, uh, people leave all these details out. And so once again, a little cheat sheet for you. And then editing. To edit is divine. You don't have to be an editor to edit. Everybody should edit what they wrote. So after you finish your draft, um, hopefully you didn't wait till the last night to write it, which I do, but um, uh, you should still take a break and revisit it later because you knew what you meant when you wrote it, right? And so every time you read it, you knew what you meant. So it, it's helpful if you take a break and get away from it for a while and then go look at it again. And uh, then it's really also helpful to get input from other uh, writers. Um, or people in your community, you know, because uh, most of you are, you know, connected to open source projects of some sort, and, uh, it, and it, uh, many people are eager to help in different ways and just reading something, you know, and giving you feedback or I didn't understand this part or whatever. Um, don't have somebody who always agrees with you and thinks you're great read your stuff. Um, I send it to the people that I'm most brutal to when I edit their stuff because they're a little mad anyway. And so then they are the most brutal when they read my stuff. And uh, so we have one good person on our team and uh, I've ripped his stuff apart a, a few times and he's a great writer, you know, but I know he can handle it because he is a really good writer and so I'll say, you know, this, this, and this. And man, he, uh, I sent him something not long ago and he took out at least a third of my content and it was much better. And at one point, he, he was like, you have two stories here, and neither of them are done. And it was one article. And uh, I was like, OK, sorry. Um, but it was really good feedback. My article was much better after, you know? And so you really want to send it to somebody who's brutal. Um, I'm not saying our, our people are brutal, but um, we would be happy to give you feedback, too. And we have an IRC channel, and a lot of our community moderators hang out in our IRC channel on Freenode. It's uh, opensource.com. And uh, that would be one of many places in your own project. Um, I'm sure that you have people um, that can help you too, but you definitely want to find the people who don't care about just making you feel good. Don't send it to you know, your, you know, your, your relatives who like you. Uh, send it to someone who doesn't, I guess. Um, so now that you've decided to write and you know what you're writing and um, you've done your research and you've sketched an outline and um, you know that you're going to edit it and you have in mind um, who's going to edit. Um, what's next? And here's where you get to start writing. And the scariest moment is always just before you start. After that, things can only get better. And uh, so I've been a, a writer and an editor for, uh, well, in technology for uh, 17 or 18 years now. Um, but I still sometimes, uh, the worst part is just getting up you know, to that point where I finally start writing and it's just total torture. Um, but then once you start writing, it's a lot easier. That's the hardest part, I think. Same thing with yeah, exercise. The hardest part is making yourself do it. And then once you're actually in there, I mean, the mental torture to get yourself there was the worst part. Um, so this isn't an ad for opensource.com. I, we are uh, a community as much as a publication, and so we really want to help people share their stories in open source, and if not on our site, anywhere, you know, but we want to make sure people's stories are out there, and so, like I said, we have uh, about 17 or 18 community moderators and, and some editors, and um, we would be happy to give feedback, you know, on your, on your uh, story ideas and proposals, and um, if you want uh, us to look at a draft, I mean, we can't do it full time for you. You'll have to hire somebody on your staff eventually, but, um, you know, if this is your first time writing, we like to work with um, first time writers and, and give feedback, so feel free to contact us. I also have some um, cards up here and some stickers, but I have cards up here that have this kind of contact information on it, too. And then I don't know how much time I have, but I usually leave time at the end to answer specific questions. If you have uh, questions about your projects or writing um, in general, uh, and, you know, I'm happy to answer questions. So. Thank you. Yes. Here's one of our community moderators. He'll, he'll uh, give you some feedback. What are your thoughts on the Oxford comma? Oh. <laughs> Okay, that's a funny story, because it, it says it on my Twitter account, um, but when I first joined the team, which has been almost a year, and so I'm the new one, I was new, I'm still the newest one on the team, and I came in and, and I didn't want to step on any toes or anything, and I was like, you know, everything's negotiable, except for the Oxford comma, I draw the line there, <laughs> you know, and I was like, we'll fight you to the death on that one, it's not even up for discussion, so, um, yeah, I have strong feelings on the Oxford comma. <laughs> 
I'm all for it. It's, it's I mean, that it's the only, it's the only option. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering if you have any oh, thoughts you. on uh, kind of measuring efficacy or engagement with uh, technical writing. So, yeah, if your audience is actually engaging with what you've written and if you are making active attempts to improve it, whether that is making an impact. Um, how to measure it or...? Well, yeah, I suppose if you're recommending changes and, like, positive things that we can do to improve our writing, so how can we know if the audience is actually benefiting from those changes? Um, well, quite a few ways. Actually, we do that on our site. Um, uh, opensource.com is very metrics-oriented. I mean, we are uh, doing reports uh, daily on um, how many people are reading what we post on social media in addition to our site and then how it's getting shared and, um, you know, testing different kinds of headlines, you know, and it's not just about um, getting a number of readers, it's were people interested, you know, and the wrong title can kill an article. And um, so as a team now, that was one process change we made as we discuss all of our titles for our articles when we realize that um, sometimes, you know, we were letting, uh, we weren't speaking up to authors and saying that's really not a great title for your article, no one's going to read it, you know, and so um, it's really following up and then asking people, um, opensource.com, we have our uh, community of uh, moderators, you know, and, and uh, they speak up and give us feedback also. And um, we pay attention when we get feedback on um, Twitter and social media. So um, unless you're writing in a vacuum, most people in open source are writing, you know, within some kind of a community. And, um, and because we're open, it's cool to reach out and say, hey, did that article suck or what could I have done to make it better, you know, um, or send it around first. And, uh, and we do that quite a bit. Did I answer your question? I wasn't sure if I was quite clear on it. Okay. Hello. Hi. Oh, hey. Hi. So I have a question. We talked about um, things that are a little bit more technical, even if they're, you know, for the lay people or whatever. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about... Um, pieces of writing that are more subjective or are opinionated, how do you kind of approach those and are they even a good idea at all in the open source community? Um, I think they're a great idea, but um, uh, provided that you back up what you're saying, everyone's got an opinion. Everybody in open source has an opinion <laughs> and they're very strong about it. I don't really care what it is if you can't back it up with something. Like, why do you have that opinion, uh, you know, uh, I can say, you know, I like um, uh, my laptop better than a Mac, which I'm not saying that because I, I really don't have a strong opinion on hardware, but um, I would want to say why and, you know, and actually show some kind of data. That's my biggest feeling about um, opinion pieces. Same thing on our site, Pe you know, people write in opinion pieces, but then I write back. I want practical explanations, not feelings in technology necessarily, unless we're talking about communities, I guess feelings, but even then um, I would want some kind of um, uh, documentation back up to support it. Any other questions? And I am, um, yes? Thank you. Uh, I know this is not an advertisement for opensource.com, but what are the advantages of writing for opensource.com? Well, I have them on this, um, this flyer here, but um, <laughs> we, uh, we actually, we, we list reasons on the site because we asked our community, why do you write for us? Um, it's not a for-profit publication, it's a community site, which means we don't have an author budget, we don't get to pay people. And um, if you're a professional journalist, which I was for quite a few years, you know, um, you will starve to death and die if you just write for us. But when I was a professional journalist, I still wrote for opensource.com one or two times, you know, because I had personal reasons for doing it. I wasn't reaching this audience. I had these audiences over here, and I liked that opensource.com had a much broader audience. We have... Um, uh, people who want to improve their writing, writing for us, because um, many publications don't take the time to give feedback and work well closely with writers. Well, we need to do that because um, uh, that's an advantage for writing for us. You know, basically we think about what is it that the person wants when they write for us. We have people who write for us because they want people to know about their new projects, and they want, or they are open sourcing an older project and they want contributors. 
Um, we have people who write for us because it's not just a, a site and a publication, it's a community. And so we really tried to foster a sense of community and, and make introductions, you know, and help people. We have multiple people who've gotten uh, jobs from writing for us because then they have this body of work to show. We have, um, the last two months, we've broken over 800,000 page views a month, and it's only a six-year-old uh, site publication, you know, and um, not many sites, tech sites are doing that anymore, you know. Um, we have bloggers who write for us because they want to build up their blog, you know, um, and so they can write for us. We don't own the content. It's still their content, but they just got um, professional editing and social media services and SEO services, and then they get to go and take this, you know, thing, and they didn't have to pay for all that and put it on their site. Um, people who need, I, I tell projects all the time, your project needs documentation, you know, have your community members who are interested, they can rank for us and we'll help edit it and everything, you know, because um, how-to articles do very well on the site, how to get started with whatever, you know, or how to do this in, in this app, you know. Um, and, and then you can go put it on your site and now you have documentation that was professionally edited and promoted, you know, so um, quite a few reasons like that. I can go on all day while you should write. You should write for us. <laughs> this isn't so much, thanks. This isn't so much of a, a question. I just want to follow up with, on Ricky's point. Um, I just hit my one year anniversary writing for opensource.com and I just wanted to say as an independent, non Red Hat shell. Um, <laughs> I mean that with love, Ricky. Um, Two year anniversary next week. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Really, it's been serious. Like, writing for opensource.com has been so much fun because, first of all, the team that runs opensource.com are really supportive and really friendly, and there's this really nice, real sense of community of, of people who've got great intentions and, and best interests in helping everyone to be successful. So I'd just say, as a very happy contributor to opensource.com, seriously, it's really a lot of fun, and it's a great group to learn more about writing great content as well. Thank you. Well, and yesterday we just announced our Reader's Choice Awards and People's Choice Awards, Moderator Awards, uh, and some other awards on our website. It's annual awards that we do. And that is um, one of the many things that we do to try to be really inclusive on the site and give recognition to people, you know, um, who are contrib uh, contributing to the community. We really consider it a community um, more than a publication. In fact, somebody asked me one time, is it, are we a publication or are we a community? And I was like, yes. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you. If you have any later, you're welcome to email me, um, ricky at opensource.com. Thanks. Thanks.